Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Y'all, there's power in the name of Jesus. There's nothing I could say up here that's greater than Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We honor you. We honor the sacrifice that you made for each and every one of us. Jesus, 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 Jesus. You're worthy, God. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. God, and we just thank you. And we count it as done. Every life will leave transformed today. And God, we thank you, God. Because it's only you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, Refuge. Good morning. Go, go, come on, y'all. Good morning, Refuge. Good morning. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty in battle. Hallelujah. I'm up here to welcome you to the house of Refuge. Oh, the Refuge Greensboro. Bless God. Huh. Look, that's OG status. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Um, we are here. I'm going to give you guys a couple of announcements. So we are doing a community giveaway. It's going to be on May the 4th. We are here to serve. So help us be the hands and feet of Jesus. Pass out flyers. We have flyers that you guys can take to your break rooms, to your community centers. Tell the people, bring your clothes and your shoes and all of your home goods, anything that you want to serve the community with. We would love that. Also, we are looking for people who have a heart for the babies, the infants, okay? Um, we want to help cultivate an atmosphere where when you come in and you have big, small children, we have a place where they can go. So if you would, please consider that. So has the Lord been good to you this week? Has the Lord been good to you this week? Stand on your feet because God is mighty. We are going to exalt him on this morning. We serve a mighty God, do we not? If you believe it, can you lift up your hands and worship him? This is what we call a dem demonstration of our sacrificial offering unto him. He's a mighty God. He saved us. Did he save you? Did he wake you up this morning, clothe you in your right mind? God, we bless you. We honor you. Say, Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty.
Corinthians chapter 11. It st says, starting at the 20th verse, when you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. What does that mean? Every time that we come together, we're not always thinking about communion. So we should always take a moment simply to remember. Can you do me a favor? Can you close your eyes and just allow your mind to go back to Calvary's cross? When Christ 
gave his life for everyone in here. Because he loved us. Can we say it one more time? They hung him high. They hung him high. They hung him high. I just want to stay right there because we, we missing something real quick. They hung him high. They hung him high. Stop it. They forgot I was a choir director for 2.5 seconds. They hung him high. They hung him high. One more time, because somebody's going to get it. They hung. So why do we stop right there? Because my word says if he be lifted up. I'm sorry. Left. If I be lifted up. It said he was going to draw all men unto him. So the fact that they hung him high means he must have been lifted up. So we thank you, God, that... They hung you high. They stretched you wide. You hung your head for us to die. So as we go to verse 23, it says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you decided to take communion with us, I want you to grab the bread and I want you to lift it up. Because we're going to go by the example that was given to us in scripture. It says, he gave thanks to God for it. Can you start thanking God for the body that he gave just for you? God, we thank you. For the sacrifice of your body that you gave at Calvary's cross. God, we're not having an emotional feeling right now. We are making a logical decision to thank you for what you have done. Thank you for this bread which represents your body. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can you break it as the scripture says and let us eat together? God, we thank you. Then it says, in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement, a covenant confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as ye drink it. So I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. Can we raise our communion cup? And can we give God thanks for the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross just for us? It was his blood that he shed for you and I. Thank you for the blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us drink together. So God, we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice that you gave for us. Thank you for a time to remember. Thank you for your body, and we thank you for the blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, since I'm already up, we're gonna go ahead and get this out of the way. It's time for us to receive our offering on today. We thank you for everything that you've been giving this year at the refuge. We, we just ask you to do what God has placed on your heart. 
Because of the way you give, we are able to do so many great things in our community. Matter of fact, just in case you don't know, coming up on May the 4th, we are having a community giveaway. And that is made possible not just by what you give as far as clothes and, and toiletries, but by the donations and the tithes and the offerings that you give. We are able to serve our community here on the east side of Greensboro. So we really take pride and take joy in being able to serve our community here. So everything that you give, we put it back into the kingdom of God. If you're giving electronically, we're gonna ask you to scan the QR code that's on your screen. When you get there, it's gonna take you to the Refuge website. We only have one thing that we ask for you to do when you get there. When you get to the giving screen, we ask you to select the Greensboro campus. Because even though we support our church, all through all of our campuses when you give to the greensboro we can use your dollars to support our community here in greensboro so we have an offertory decree that we do every week we want you to read this with us this is not just for me to read but it's for all of us to read and i want y'all to read it loud and as if you mean what it says are y'all ready it says i bless you with increase according to the word of god that God himself will throw open the windows of heaven and bestow blessings on you that you can't even contain. I call in jobs for the jobless, better jobs for those who desire and need them. I bless you with opportunities for advancements and raises, that bonuses and unexpected surprises would come to you. And as they do, they will remind you of what a great father you have. I Bless entrepreneurs and inventors, those who own their own businesses, and those of you who work in sales and commissions, that God would attract customers and clients and business to you, and that as you are blessed, you then would be the example of the generosity of God and the ways you generously bless and treat others. And I bless you today with true biblical prosperity, as Paul defines in 2 Corinthians 9, and it is declared that he who supplies bread for food, seed for sowers, will also supply and increase your store of seed, so that you'll be made rich in every way, so that you then can be generous on every occasion. If you believe God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ever ask or think, I want you to lift up a praise unto him as if it's already done. Come on, that doesn't sound like it's already done. Can we lift up a praise as if it's already done? and then they called me out. You see, because that's the kind of pastors we have, but we thank God for them. We want them to come up to the stage. Y'all clap for them as they come. Yeah. They don't always like this, because I saw Pastor Amy give me the eye like, you going up to that stage again to give something? Yes, we are. I gave you Bible last time, just in case you think we're doing a little too much. This one is Luke, ha <laughs> ha, all right. Luke 10, this is when Jesus was sending out the 70 evangelists. Go back and read it, it's a good one. And it says, verse seven, and in the same house, this one, uh -huh, remain. 
eating and drinking such things as they give for the laborer is worthy of his hire. We want you guys to know that you are so worthy yeah. of what you do for us. We want to bless you this time around just as a married couple. You have a new little one. And we know that date nights don't come easy when you got little babies, honey, because I got two. Jesus, help us. But in the moments where there is no sitter, but the babies are asleep, we got you this cute little picnic basket that y'all can spread out in the living room and some goodies where you guys can have a date night. You pour into charm, you pour into our marriages, you pour into our relationships, and we want God to continue to do the work in yours. So we love you so much. Let's have one more time for our leaders. Hallelujah. God bless you. Come on, can we just continue to give God praise to have, to have pastors that love on us, but also demonstrate their love for Christ. So can we just open up our mouths and just give God glory? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, you're majestic, you're mighty, you're strong. You are an amazing God. And so for this, we exalt you. For this, we give you praise. We put everything aside and we fix our gaze. We fix our eyes on you. So can we open up our mouths as worshipers? Glory, hallelujah. Come on, not for us, for him. Come on, open your mouth and give God glory. You're holy, holy, holy. You're holy, holy, holy. You are our God. You are our God. Come on, can we press some more? Come on, open your mouth and give God glory. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Oh, oh. 
most faithful, faithful. You are faithful, faithful, faithful. Faithful, faithful, faithful. You are faithful, faithful, faithful.
the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names.
Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you for getting us through this week. Thank you that your mercy has never failed me. Come on, refuge. God, I bless you. God, I thank you. Woo! I wouldn't have made it without him. I wouldn't have made it without him. As you're taking your seats, can you greet somebody right around you? Can you welcome them to the refuge? We're a hugging church. Tell them it's so good to see you. Everybody over here, how you doing? Good morning. Good morning, Mitt. Hello. Hi. Good morning. If you have a middle school, high school student at this time, you guys are being dismissed to go downstairs for our refugee youth. So it's really exciting. Y'all look really good today. Y'all look real good. So glad y'all are here this morning. Didn't Pastor Josh do an incredible job last week? Y'all, I'm not saying this because he's my husband, but I have literally been thinking about that word all week. And so some of the things that he preached last week, I'm gonna tie it in to what I am preaching this week. Um, But for some of you guys that may not know this, April is not only our pastoral anniversary, It is also this month, the 20th year anniversary of the refuge as a whole. Yeah, you can clap, that's a big deal. 20 years of any ministry, one year is a big deal, amen? (laughs) But 20 years since Pastor Jay and Pastor Mel started the church and since then, there has been so much that God has done. And so to celebrate that, we um, ask one of the members of our church if she would just do a little, not interview, but she would just explain to us what the refuge has meant to her. And so if you guys, before I preach, if you will turn your attention to the screen. I really am a firm believer that 
you don't you don't choose the church that you go to based on your likes and dislikes. I really believe that you pray and ask God where He wants you to be. My name is Becky Sell. I've been at the Refuge Greensboro for two years now. God has given me a heart for diversity and blending cultures together and really you know, just, just standing to fight against racism and so many things that are happening in our world. And so I felt God really nudged me saying, you know, Sunday mornings are a very segregated time. I want you to be against that. I want you to, to, to be more um, in a more diverse church to worship. Thankfully, the church I was at did worship very similarly to how we do here. So I think I think in many ways that, that God had me there preparing me, you know, for coming here. Um, but I just, when I visited here, I just, I felt the tug here. I said, okay, God, I feel like this is where you're calling me to be. If I'm wrong, then, then set me right. And, um, and he hasn't said anything yet, so I've still been here. Um, so, but I love being in a diverse community. I love that we can all worship together. We all worship the same God. I got involved with um, the serve ministry and the kids ministry right away. So the serve ministry being, being the greeting team and then just cleaning up the sanctuary afterwards. And then of course working with kids is always fun. And, and you get to meet the parents and get to know people. I've always um, sang on worship teams. And I really felt like God was saying to wait before I got involved on the worship team here, but I've recently started doing that. So it's all, that's all I'm just trying to do, you know, what God's telling me to do. So I'm thankful that God has placed me in a smaller church where you really can not, not just build community with a certain group of people, but you can with, with everybody here. I love how Pastor Amy is so open and real from the pulpit. She's not afraid to, to talk about her mistakes. She's not afraid to talk about her past. And I appreciate that in a pastor who is very open about things like that. And Pastor Josh and Amy welcomed me immediately, knew my name, and like I told them one time, and they immediately knew it. Would come up and hug me every Sunday, and they were very instrumental in making me feel welcome here. I'm seeing that too, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Y'all know I'm a crier, it's fine. Um, but we are so excited for every person that has been at the refuge for the whole time. Maybe you just started coming to the Greensboro campus. Some of you have only been coming here as long as we've been here. So you've all known. But everybody's story is so intricate to what God is doing. And so if I don't tell you enough, thank you. Thank you for being obedient to God. Thank you for being a part of this story that is so beautiful and instrumental. So we're really excited. I love you. Woo. Let's get in this word. You ready? So the title of today's message is called Unseen. Y'all okay? Everybody got caught? It's called Unseen. And so if you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to 1 Samuel 16? The definition of seen is to see and be noticed by important or fashionable people. In 1 Samuel 16, we're going to start in verse 1. It says this. It says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him, and they asked, do you come in peace? And Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them 
to the sacrifice, verse 6. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. And Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? They're still the youngest. The message version says they're still the runt. Isn't that aggressive? He is tending the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. And so he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing in health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. And so Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then Samuel then went to Ramah. Now, I am not going to be before you long, so I need you to just really like... Give me all your attention, okay? They ain't hungry today. They, they, they bring what? Give me all your attention. So let's break this down. Verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Here is the thing. We all have a Saul. Something that the Lord instructed us to do something that the Lord helped us get to. Some of you may not know the story, but Israel wanted a king like all the other nations. And they told Samuel, who was a prophet, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. He was like, fine, I'll give you what you want. And so he anointed Saul to be king. And it started out so good in the beginning. But if you read before chapter 16, you will see that Saul became disobedient to the prophet and didn't wait for him before the sacrifice. He just thought he could do it himself. And so all of a sudden, he got too comfortable in the seat. And so because of this, the Lord rejected him as king. And so now we see Samuel grieving what he chose and having to deal with God saying, this isn't it anymore. Have you ever been there? It doesn't necessarily mean that it was bad. God blessed you with the job, but now he's saying it's time to go. He sent you these friends to get you through the hurdle of your life, but now all of a sudden God's taking you somewhere and they're not going. It's your soul, and now you're having to say, I got to take you somewhere else. It hurts. Soul does not necessarily have to be a negative thing. It can also be a good thing. It could be habits. And as I walk with the Lord, it was fine in the beginning. But the closer I get to God, the more I ask him to search me, all of a sudden I'm uncomfortable. And now I am grieving something that I didn't even realize I was so attached to. But I love how confrontational our God is because he didn't say, hey, how are you doing? How long are you going to grieve this thing? Because you got something to do. And so I would ask you this morning... Who is your Saul? And how long are you going to keep grieving an old season? Because the presence isn't there anymore. It was so great, and it was a time for that. It was a time when the Spirit moved. You would play a certain key. I don't know my keys. I'm so sorry. But the glory would fall, and now you try to do it again, and it don't hit the same. I sang the song before. I prayed the same way before. I fasted this way before in an old season. And now it's not working and I am grieving because I had gotten into the groove of this. And now I find myself grieving Saul. But now in order to be in the wheel in the presence of God, he is asking more of you. 
Look at somebody, say, how long you gonna mourn him? So as you're, as you're thinking this week, take your notes, what is my saw? And is grieving it keeping me from obedience? Because how long will you mourn him since I have rejected him because I say I want what God wants for my life? But then once the presence isn't there anymore, I want to go back. It's like the Israelites in Egypt. I didn't like it when I was there, but I got out here and now I'm uncomfortable and I'd rather go back to slavery than be free. And so I grieve bondage. So now I am grieving something that had me bound in a previous season. The one thing that I would pray God for to release me from, and now that he's given me the power to release, now I'm sitting here unable to move forward because I am crippled by fear. And so now I am being disobedient to what he's asking me to do. It doesn't look like the old season, Pastor Amy. It doesn't feel the same. It's similar, but it's not the same. And I'm just, I'm so out of sorts. Because Samuel came back in verse 2. God asked him a question, he confronted him, gave him instruction, and he does what we always do. He gave an excuse. How can I go? Because if Saul hears about it, if this thing hears about it, if this person hears about it, he'll kill me, or they'll have something to say, or they'll judge me, or they'll think wrong of me. So what we see here is I have to find the root of my excuse. Samuel, even though he was a prophet of God, had a tie to his choice. He had such a deep-rooted tie to this choice that the opinion of Saul meant more to him than the direction of God. And so sometimes when I walk into a season and I know that God gave it to me, God gave me this, it is really hard to disconnect from it because it's hard to imagine that God could give me something better outside of this. Because we have this mindset that when God brings it, he's just going to keep me here for 40 years. That ain't true. And I become rooted in a thing, and now it has become my God outside of him. And so if you find yourself asking God, saying, I can't do this. I can't go here. I can't transition to this job. I can't do the more. What is the root of your excuse? Is it pride because you don't want people to know that a season has ended that you bragged about, gloated about, you said it was God, and now all of a sudden the presence isn't in anymore? Is it fear because you've gotten comfortable in this place? And even though you know that God isn't moving the way he used to, because you're comfortable, now I'm scared to do something different. So you have to ask the Lord to reveal that to you and to show you what it is because there is something for you to do. So then he kept going. I love that Jesus didn't coddle him. His excuse was valid. If Saul hears about this, I'm going to die. Jesus didn't skip a beat. He said, invite Jesse to the sacrifice. No, he said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. So he gave him strategy. God isn't going to move you without proper strategy. He's also not going to coddle you in this season because some of us have been sitting in the seat of disobedience too long and we keep saying we're in our grace season but God says I still have something for you to do so in your grief come on you've been in here long enough and so he said here is the strategy when they question you And I need you to invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. And look at verse 4. Here he is. Samuel did what the Lord said. (laughs) So when it says in verse 5, when Samuel got there, he said, Yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. He says something very interesting here. He says, Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Consecration means to set apart. It means to dedicate. 
And in biblical context, it was a preparing oneself or others to participate in something sacred. So a sacrifice then, you couldn't just roll up any kind of way. You couldn't just touch the presence of God and just offer him anything you wanted. There was a process. And so I think when we read this story, we think, consecrate yourself. Okay, let me go pray real quick before we go to the church house, right? But in those days, consecration took several days. It was a washing of yourself. It was a changing of clothes. Sometimes they would refrain from intimacy with their husband or their wife. And in this context, it doesn't tell us which they did. But I need you to understand that consecration was not a quick thing. It was a process. Because if so, you will read this like, consecrate, and in two hours, I'm going to meet you at the sacrifice. But that's not how it was. There was, a, there was a process here. So when the, they arrived, the sons are here. They're consecrated. They're at the house. And it said when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. This is why it is important to make sure you uproot the ties to the previous season, good or bad. Why is that? Because it says, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. Why is that important? Why does it matter about his height? Because the first description of Saul that we heard about was that he was a head taller than everyone else. Everyone saw Saul. But nobody, so when he saw Eliab, Eliab reminded him of a previous season. Eliab reminded him of his first pick, the last place that he was in. And because it was comfortable and it looked well, surely this is the one God has for me. Surely this is the job. Surely this is the school. Surely this is the degree. Why? Because God had, this is why knowing the voice of God is so important because you will pick things based out of emotionalism. You will pick things out of comfort and not with what God is saying. Eliab was the most prominent choice. Why? Because it's all that Saul knew. Samuel knew. So if I don't uproot it, when I see something, I will assume that's it based on where I've been. But God is changing the way I see. You with me? The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So we read on down in 8, that Abinadab came and that wasn't it. Shama came and then 7 came and it still wasn't it. And so then he asked Jesse if there was any more sons. And so he said, yeah, he is out tending the sheep. Pastor Josh changed my whole perspective of the word wait last week. Sometimes we think, maybe you wasn't here, but if you think about waiting, you think about sitting down, a waiting room kind of situation, right? That makes sense. But what about when you go to a restaurant and you say, they what? Waited on me. Did they sit down when you go to the restaurant today? Are they going to sit down and just look at you? I hope not. Don't tip them. <laughs> Will they sit on their phone distracted? If they do, don't tip them. No, when I say that they waited on me, it means that they served me. They made sure my cup was full. They made sure my food was hot. They made sure that we were okay, that the table was okay, that I had high chairs for all my kids. They waited on us. And so sometimes in the wait, we're not waiting correctly. I want you to notice that David was never invited to the sacrifice. He was never invited to the consecration, but he was tending sheep. He was serving. So when everybody else was trying to be holy and they still wasn't the choice, the man that God needed was found serving. 
because some people will only serve if they are invited. But there is a heart posture for service that says, you don't even have to invite me or ask me to take out the trash. I'm going to do it because I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it because it's where I'm supposed to be. And so David's heart was right. And so I am studying this week, and I had a question. And I'm sure all of you have already asked the Lord this, but I had not. I have heard this story 18 billion times. My father was a pastor. My stepdad was a pastor. I have sat here, okay? But I said, God, you had all these people consecrate, and they still were not picked. And if consecration is a washing of your body and changing of your clothes, and he said, but you got to go get David. Well, he's tending sheep. David didn't have time to consecrate. Hear me. He was serving and working. That means he said, I will not sit down until you go get him. So they had to get him. He came fresh off the field. Smelling like the sheep that he had been serving. And God said, rise, this is the one. And then it goes on. I'm getting ahead of my notes, but you've got to get this because I was so tore up in my house. I love the word of God so much. This is why you got to read it. You got to read it, okay? Because here's the thing. Look, in verse 13, it says, so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his Brothers. Consecration. Let me read this again because I don't want to get this wrong because God gave it to me and I don't want to mess up what Jesus said because I love him. It was preparing oneself or others to participate in something sacred. They thought they were preparing to be anointed for a seat. God was calling them to consecrate so that they could be in the presence of the anointing of the next king. He was debunking everything. Why did it matter? Because in the culture, God was breaking down religion in this story. Because I can consecrate myself, but my heart never be consecrated. I can fast everything, take everything away, but it never, ever penetrates the heart. And so when God began to say, the Lord doesn't look at the things that people look at. I look at the heart. It was prophetic that all people can now come to him any kind of way. But he what? We asked Jesus to come and live where? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so let me tell you something. For all of you who feel unseen in the room, his father didn't see him. His brothers did, it didn't even ring a bell. Hey, we probably need to invite him to the sacrifice. Samuel was clear. Bring yourself and your sons. He just brought the seven and left little David out there in the field. And the prophet didn't even see him. So what do you do when you're sitting in a service and everybody gets a word but you, but you know you have a calling on your life? Does it interrupt your service? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see him. And not only will you see him, but he sees you. So how does God find me? By the posture of my heart. And so if you are a leader, a business owner, a teacher, a principal, you do hiring. Can you begin to ask people and ask God, not people, ask the Lord, to show you people's heart? If you're single and dating, I know they look good. But can you please ask God to show you their heart? 
When you're picking friends and you're in transition, can you please begin to pray, God, show me their heart? Because if not, you're going to have a repeat season because you're going to keep picking the same people to date, the same friends to have, the same circles to go into because you are comfortable with what you used to have, but the presence of God is not there anymore. Get your horn. You have got somewhere to go. There is a different anointed place, and God is asking you, will you cut ties? Will you stop grieving what you think you lost and let's go into this new place it is not going to look like what you think David was a boy notice when they described him he was handsome but they never talked about his height because God picked him in seed form he wasn't grown yet and so as leaders my prayer is God let me see people because sometimes I just want a full bush. I need you to already be a laborer. I need you to already know this thing. I need you to know how to pray. I need you to know your Bible because I need help and I'm tired. <laughs> but we're getting people in seed form. And so you will discount the seed. And so if you are a leader in here, hear me, my leaders. Look at your teams and look at the people and do not look at their outward appearance. Do not pay attention to their past or what they came out of. Because if we say that he who the sun sets free is free indeed, you got to believe that thing. So don't you put a thing on them prematurely because it don't look like what you think. Because now God is calling us to cultivate it. Some of us would have been discounted seeds. If we had not asked God to give those people the right eyes to see us, not where we were in the moment, but what God was calling us to in our future. So yes, David was anointed, but there was this whole process that happened to cultivate him to be king. He didn't become king the next day. Honey, in fact, the very next verse, after it said Samuel went to Rama, it says, and an evil spirit hit Saul immediately. So the presence left one area, and evil came to the next. And that is what led David to play for Saul. That's how he got into the presence of that seat, to play for him. And so some of you are in a process, but I'm asking you not to discount the seed. And for some of you who don't feel like you're seen, I come here to let God sees you. But you got to keep your heart pure. Because sometimes when, I say it again, sometimes when we're not invited and sometimes when we feel overlooked, the enemy will use that to bring bitterness into your heart. Or you will get prideful and say, well, somebody else will see me somewhere else. And you will uproot yourself and go to another ministry. But you're being led by pride, not by God. Because the humble heart I will serve whether they see me or not. I will be faithful whether I get a mic or not. I'm going to be in the trenches whether I ever get a thank you or not. It is a heart posture. And so as you stand all over this room, because I'm done, I need you to ask the Lord, God, check my heart. Because it's easy to do it when everybody knows you. It's easy to do it when everybody sees you. God isn't moved by our titles. But he is moved by our heart. And whatever your seat is, wherever you are, you might be a CEO, a lawyer, a doctor, I'm not talking about just ministry seats. Don't let the seat poison your heart. I just want God to see me, Pastor Amy, keep your heart pure. Pastor Josh said it so beautifully. You're like, oh, this is just a shameless plug to get us to serve in the church. And I'm tired. No, it's not. 
Serving to God could be the way you love your wife. Serving the Lord could be the way you treat your husband, the way you parent your kids, the way you love your nieces and your nephews, your grandchildren, the way you handle your finances. That is all, it's all worship. It's all waiting on God. It's all serving him. I'm not doing a shameless plug, honey. You serve because God asked you to serve. I'm not going to beg nobody. That's between you and the good Lord. And he will deal with you. But in the meantime, no matter where you go in this life, God keep me and my heart pure. Can you lift your hands all over this building? I just want to pray over your heart this morning. Clean hands and a pure heart, God. Thank you for every place that you have led us to. Thank you for debunking religion out of us that it's not so much what we look like and the things that we do. If our heart is not pure, you reject it. Mm. So God, for all of those who feel unseen, will you begin to slowly uncover them? Help leaders and jobs and places begin to see them because of the purity of their heart. Remind them that everything that they've done this far has not been in vain. David was cheerful in that field. I come against bitterness for not being invited. Rifts that would try to tear where they feel like there's favoritism and it's not. For such a time as this, may you not get out of the pace of God. And may we check our motives for why we want to be seen. Because once we're seen, it comes with its whole other thing of warfare. So if I can't handle the warfare in my hiding, God will wait until you can handle it in your exposure. And so God, help me to keep my heart pure. Check it for resentment and pride. May all of my consecration, God, I can give everything up for you, but if you still don't have my heart, it was all in vain. David and his brothers were asked to consecrate and it still didn't stick. It all has to come from a heart posture. God, let us serve well in our families, on our jobs, in our schools, with our friends, in Target's line. God, help us to serve you. May our mouth, our thinking, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So reveal to us, God, the areas in our heart that is producing stuff that does not bring you glory. I surrender it now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Listen, before you guys dismiss, I know you're about to go, but we believe in salvation at this church. I don't ever want to take for granted that because somebody's been coming a while that they have really asked Jesus into their heart or just because their family comes that they have surrendered. And so how we do it here is we ask everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads. And I want you just to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and that you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. I repent of my sins. I invite you to come into my heart and my life. I want to trust and follow you 
as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. With eyes still closed and head bowed, if you prayed that prayer this morning for the first time, could you just lift your hand right where you are? If you prayed it for, I see you, I see you. If your hand is raised, I just want you to know somebody is going to come to you when we were um, when we res- uh, exit. They're going to come and they're going to lead you downstairs. They're going to give you a Bible. They're going to explain to you about salvation, what it means. They're going to give you instruction about our Bible studies and ways that you can get connected. So follow them. It's nothing weird. It's nothing creepy. We just want to make sure that now that you have made one of the best decisions of your life, you have the discipleship and the family to help support you. Amen. So Refuge, listen, we love you with our whole hearts. The altar is open if you need prayer. Have a Refuge strong week, and I will see you next time. Online family, thank you so much for joining us for our 11 a.m. experience. Listen, if you've been checking us out for a while and you're curious, come and join us sometime. We're at 3008 East Bessemer here in Greensboro, North Carolina. We have 9 and 11 a.m. services. Maybe you want to join or maybe you want to join a small group or volunteer or learn ways that you can give toward what God is doing here on the east side. Listen, we would love to have you in any capacity. You can find all of our information on our website or on the app. We look forward to seeing you soon. Have a refuge strong week.